Okay, good evening. It's 7.30 at Newfoundland time, so let's get started. Uh, hello, my name is Darlene Scott. I'm at the Community Sector Council in St. John's. Uh, welcome to everybody who is with us tonight for Assessing Risk and Purchasing Insurance. I'm going to be your primary presenter tonight, but we do have a guest uh, who I'm going to introduce you to in a moment, and his name is Craig Rowe. The first thing I want to do is uh, say a big thank you to Volunteer Mount Pearl because Volunteer Mount Pearl initiated this series of webinars so that people um, can sign in, learn a little bit about how to become an effective volunteer on a board of directors and that's always a good thing in our sector. So a major big thanks to Volunteer Mount Pearl for sponsoring this and uh, I know you'll all get a chance to say uh, thank you to Debbie when we open up the lines and let her say hello. Darlene, would you like me to do that just now? Uh, not just yet. I actually oh, uh, I have it specifically suggested on one of the slides, which is the one oh, after this. Very one. good. Okay. Um, so just a few quick starters here. Thanks everybody for being here. Be sure to turn up the volume on your speakers and you may have to turn them up also on your computer desktop. This is a one hour webinar and I promise we'll be out in time for everybody to go and watch Brad win the briar or get close to winning the briar tonight. So we will finish up at 8.30. Now, if you do want to ask us something, it is possible. I want you to type your question in the question chat box, which should be on the right of your screen. And if it's not open, just click on the little red arrow and it will open. And if you actually put your hand up, and you can see a little image there, uh, Josh Smee, who was with me, um, helping out with all the technical things tonight, he can actually open your mic and let you speak. So we're gonna, there's going to be a little bit more about that a little bit later in the hour. Our slides are going to be available as a video on uh, www.communitysector.nl.ca and we also will email a link to you uh, afterwards so that you will actually be able to click into the recording on tonight's webinar. So you're muted for now, only Darlene and Craig are going to present, but we are going to open up the mic, uh, as I said, down near the bottom of the hour for you to speak and before that for Craig Rowe to speak. And I also want us, and Josh, now is the time that I'm going to ask you to do that. I uh, also want to open the mic so maybe Debbie O'Reilly already has her hand up for Joshua. And I want Debbie to say hello from Volunteer Mount Pearl. All right, Debbie, your mic is open. I am here. Hi, folks. Good evening. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us again tonight for our third in this webinar series. Thank you so much the, for the Community Sector Council for putting everything together. Uh, Volunteer Mount Pearl is um, an organization created specifically to help organizations and the volunteers who need them. Um, so if you need anything after we get through this webinar series or in between, um, feel free to contact me. You can go to volunteermountpearl.ca um, to find all my contact information. But I want to thank uh, Darlene and Josh very much for um, for putting this together once again. And uh, hi to Craig for jumping in and giving us some of your expertise as well. Good luck, everyone. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Joshua and Debbie. So just a little bit by way of introductions. As I mentioned, my name is Darlene Scott, and I work here at the Community Sector Council in St. John's. I've um, actually been here for a number of years. I'm also an active volunteer in the community, and I have reported directly to a board of directors, and I have been on a board of directors as a volunteer, as many of you are. So I hope you will think of me as a person who's a little bit well-rounded in terms of volunteer governance and board readiness. So hopefully we'll get a few questions, but uh, you're going to be listening to me talk a lot. Uh, and the other person that I do want to uh, introduce and get you to say hello to now or listen to for a moment is Craig Rowe. Now Craig is also, um, he's the founder um, and CEO of an insurance company, but he's also a very busy volunteer in our community. He's had numerous volunteer uh, opportunities. He chaired the board of directors for the YMCA in St. John's uh, recently, and he is currently uh, the chair of uh, the Canada-wide YMCA. So here's a guy who's uh, 
going to give us the benefit of his knowledge about the insurance industry tonight, but believe me, he has put his hours in as a volunteer as well. So Josh, I would be delighted if you just opened the mic for a couple of minutes and allowed uh, Craig to say hello before we get into the presentation. All right, uh, Craig has muted himself, so Craig, you can unmute yourself now. There you go. I see you green, so I'll hand it over to you. Oh, uh, thanks very much, Darlene, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak tonight. Like I said, I'm uh, very involved in the sector, and I love working with you guys, so happy to help out where I can. And I'm a bit of a geek when it comes to my industry, so I love talking to uh, other volunteers about risk and insurance and trying to help out where I can. So. Just happy to be here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Craig. Yes, thanks a lot. So one final thing about the series that Debbie mentioned. Our final session is on March 23rd, and we're not going to do that as a webinar. We're going to do it in person in Mount Pearl at 44 Arena Avenue at the Soccer Hut. And if you have attended at least three of the four sessions in this series, we're going to give you a certificate that night. So keep your records and we'll uh, tell you soon how, uh, how it's possible for you to get that certificate printed for yourself. So just a little bit about how we're going to spend this hour. Um, I'm going to do the bulk of the talking right up front. I'm going to fill in a little bit of context and background about why we would even do anything about risk assessment and the purchase of insurance. I'm actually going to try and answer the question, what is insurance? And Craig has promised me that he will help me out when he comes online if I've said anything in error. I'm going to give you a quick primer and actually a little bit of an exercise that you can take away to your fellow board members on how to actually look at risk management and do a little bit of an assessment of the risk that your board of directors might be facing. I, do, I will make a quick comment about board liability. Most of the organizations who are with us tonight are incorporated organizations and you incorporate and put bylaws in place for the very specific reason of limiting your liability. So I'm going to come back and mention your bylaws very, very briefly. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic kinds of insurance, especially a couple of them, uh, that you may need. But I'm going to leave the bulk of the descriptive information to our guest, uh, Craig Rowe, who is going to go through a range of the insurance policies that you might have to choose from. So I'm going to talk about the two biggies and he's going to talk about everything else that you might want or need. And either one of us will try to answer some questions, uh, for example, on where you can purchase insurance because some people don't even know uh, where to pick up the phone and actually go looking for insurance. And at the very end, after we have our discussion, I do hope to return to the slides and talk a little bit about the best practices and how to be a wise purchaser of insurance. So just to remind you and show you where the link is, it's at the Community Sector Council. We will not only provide you with a copy of the webinar recording, we'll make sure that uh, a couple of handouts that Craig and I have looked at will be provided to you as well. So they will be both emailed to you and posted at the website. And Volunteer Mount Pearl is probably going to make them available on their website as well. So I'm going to jump in a little bit here now and just kind of uh, do some of the contextual pieces. We've, we here at the Community Sector Council have been dealing with the insurance and risk issue with our colleagues in the sector for quite some time. It was an issue that really blew up for our sector about 15 years ago. Between 2001 and 2003, there was a flurry of activity. It was a really defining time in our sector. You will remember that that was post 9-11 when all of the insurance companies around the world and all of the people who insure the insurance companies and participate in the stock market to make sure there's lots of money floating around in that industry. Um, that, that group was going through a very traumatic time because of 9-11. But additionally, you will all remember that in our sector, we were dealing with the issue of whether volunteers even had liabilities or should even have to purchase insurance uh, because we had I think for a long time felt that, well, we were nice, good, altruistic, and maybe even charitable organizations, and gosh, nobody would ever sue us. And then the church issue blew up, and the Boy Scout issue blew up, and everybody realized that, guess what, you know, we are perhaps vulnerable on some liability issues. It's not just about doing good in our society. Now, 
obviously since 2001 there has been a huge acceptance of the fact that we do have liability issues in our sector and we often carry vicariously, i.e. as a second party, the liability for things that our volunteers are doing in the community. So we sort of develop that little rule of thumb that if we set up the conditions under which somebody was harmed, i.e. if we were a church or a youth group and we put children in a vulnerable position, for example, yes, guess what? Our nonprofit boards do carry some liability there. So there's been a lot more acceptance of those issues in the last 15 years. I'm happy to report, too, that agents are better informed about the needs in our sector because when all of this happened about 15 years ago, we started looking for various kinds of insurance from agents and, gosh, we learned that, wow, they know a lot about fire and auto, but they don't know anything about what it is to serve on a board of directors or what kind of an insurance we might look for to reduce our liability or spread our risks around. So over the last few years, agents have become far better informed about the needs in our sector. And there are, are, of course, now far more insurance products available for us to purchase from. Sometimes it almost seems like a confusing array of products that we can choose from. Additionally, however, uh, some leaders in our society have become more responsive to the needs in our sector, and there's a couple of resources that I would really like to point out to you tonight. The first one is at Volunteer Canada, and the second one is um, in Alberta at uh, the Calgary Chamber of Voluntary Organizations. But just to go back to Volunteer Canada for a minute, they have kept current on needs in our sector and all the time they're changing products that they have available and putting more, more and more information online at volunteer.ca for you in the sector. And I always tell people to check out their page at Volunteer Canada. It's called, it's now called Under Our Wing. Uh, because they keep current on the issues and additionally if you are a member of Volunteer Canada which only costs $100 a year you can if you want to participate in their insurance scheme which they have in place with a company called BMS it used to be AON Reed, Reed Stenhouse and I think for a while it was Andrews Insurance but currently it's BMS and I tell people to go there, for example, to maybe start their comparison shopping. They used to put the prices online. Now, I've noticed in the last few months that they have not been doing that. Maybe that depends on their insurance supplier. I'm not sure. But they are a wealth of information. In Alberta at CCVO, the uh, Calgary Chamber, they have online, and I know it's dated 2006, and that seems like it's really old because it is a decade out. They have a fantastic toolkit on insurance available for download, and I will make sure that that, as a handout, is available to you at our website as well. Because even though 2006 in this age of the Internet seems like a long time ago, that information is still fairly current, and you will learn a lot about assessing risk and purchasing insurance if you go to the Alberta toolkit. So those are a couple of really good resources. So I'm going to jump right into the whole uh, issue of risk management and which starts with risk assessment. And we always ask ourselves the question, because we're busy as volunteers on boards of directors, why we have to um, spend an awful lot of time dealing with this issue of managing and assessing risk. Well there are a couple of very straightforward reasons for doing it. Managing risks actually reduces the chance that something is going to go wrong in your organization. And although even, you know, tonight's session is not about workers' comp, I do occasionally like to mention them when I'm talking about the role of risk management because if you're in a workplace in Newfoundland and Labrador, you know that the workers' comp people will pursue you to make sure that you follow safe practices, that you have a committee in place that's inspecting your work site, et cetera, et cetera. Now, they're not doing that to be mean. They are doing it because research has steadily shown throughout the free world that if you spend time managing risk, you actually will reduce the chance that something goes wrong in your organization. So I'd just like to put that out there. Secondly, a good reason for practicing assessment and management of risk is that insurers, if you are going to look for insurance, for example, they will want to know that you are practicing risk management. They don't have to sell you a policy, for example, and they have every right to say to you, well, 
we practice risk uh, management and risk assessment. We want to know if you're a risky business. So they are going to ask you if you are practicing risk management. And guess what? If you're not practicing risk management or if you're doing it sloppily, they could take a pass on you too. So it's always a good idea to have a firm understanding of the role of both risk management and the assessment of the risk that you're facing. So a risk management strategy starts with a risk assessment. And the one that I like to talk about has seven steps. I'm actually only going to spend time on number two, three, and four. But very briefly, the first thing I would say is that your, if your board is going to assess and manage its risk, it probably should form a committee to start the work. And that is because this is a job, like many jobs on volunteer boards that should not be done by one person. You should kind of spread out the work here because everybody on your board is managing your board and everybody on your board should be concerned about risk. So more than one person is kind of a touchstone. Just to scooch down now to five, six, and seven, any good strategy or process has an action plan and maybe some timelines in there for implementing your plan. So give that some thought. And I will return at the last slide to the idea that you should monitor and review your risk management strategy and how you assess your risks. Always a good idea to do some things annually, some things you want to do on a very regular basis. So that's the quick part. I just want to move on now, as I promised, to two, three, and four. So if you are going to identify your risks, it's not actually that hard. I'm going to pretend that we're talking tonight, for example, about a nonprofit daycare center that's being established in, a, in the community, or maybe it's already up and running. What you do when you're going to identify the risks that your organization is facing or might face is a simple exercise of listing. Create a list of all of the activities that happen on your site or off your site. And if you have off-site activities, go visit them so you have a visual on what's happening. And then you should brainstorm a list of how things could go wrong or what injuries might, for example, occur and to whom. This is the fun part of risk management and assessment, the brainstorming part. It's actually a very calming exercise. It actually calms you down when you write that big long list of all of the things that could go wrong in your organization. Because what you're trying to do is sort out, well, how will I approach it? What am I going to do about it? So that's, like I say, that's the fun part. One of the things I like to point out here in identifying your risks is that we should reach out to the people who are in our sector when we're doing this. Let's reach out to other nonprofit daycare centers and ask them, for example, if you're considering insurance, what kinds of claims they may have had in the past. And of course, you can research it online. And the reason I do that is because everybody, when they go through the brainstorming exercise, has a tendency to catastrophize. They think of the worst possible things. And sure, you should think about that, but you should think about the little things too. And if you reach out to others in our sector, maybe even in other provinces, and ask them what kind of insurance claims they've had, well, guess what? The, the five or six things that you have been keeping you awake at night are not the things that bothered them at all. And they'll say, well, gosh, that never happened to us, but why don't you consider looking at this as a risky area? So work your networks. We are community-based. Reach out to other peoples in the community. Now, a quick little tip here. When you're going through this exercise, and tonight we're talking about insurance, you should be looking at things uh, and trying to keep in mind where your risks are with the people that you work with, the property that you own or you rent, how much income your organization has, i.e., where does your revenue come from, what are your general liabilities overall, but also think about the reputation of your organization. Anything can go wrong with your organization, and nobody will sell you an insurance policy that is going to fix up the reputation that you have in your community. So that's just a little tip. I want you to keep that in mind. One of the things I would say now is that I'm just going to pretend again that we have a um, nonprofit daycare center, and I'm going to do the brainstorming for you as your exercise. I'm going to mention four things, and very soon you'll see why I'm mentioning four things. 
let's say uh, one of the risks that we throw up on that uh, imaginary flip chart is, gosh, our daycare center is in an old building and we think the windows are going to rot. Sure, that's a risk for sure. Um, somebody is definitely bound to throw up on that flip chart. Well, the building might burn down. That's a risk that we face. I'm going to say that maybe in an imaginary way somebody could miss your building and not get uh, the children in as your clients because your building is older and it's out of sight and there's no good signs on the road or you don't have uh, proper information on your website to show people where your building is. So, hey, you're going to lose some clients. I'm also going to suggest that something that could go wrong is that, gosh, in the backyard of this imaginary daycare, there's an old well that's exposed in the backyard, which you have paid money to fence so that the children can go out in the backyard to play. So let's just pretend that those are our four risks, and you'll see why I mentioned four in just a sec. So I'm going to move on to that next step that I identified for you, and that is that you have to spend some sort of time evaluating your risks. And this is uh, the three-part sort of yardstick that you will use. And I'm going to show you, remember I promised you an exercise, one quick way to do it. Here is what you should have on your mind. Have you put all of this stuff up on a flip chart? What is the likelihood, really and truly, what is the likelihood of occurrence? What's the chance that that's going to happen? Because that's important to the exercise. And then you have to think of, well, what is the potential degree of harm to self, that's our organization, remember it's a nonprofit daycare center, and others who might be interacting with us. So the potential degree of harm, is it high or is it low? And then you have some way, you devise some way to rank them. Could be from highest to lowest, or it could be on the exercise that I'm going to show you now, which is actually a grid. So I want you to kind of mentally go in this exercise to plotting in the four corners of this little grid here if something happens a lot or if it doesn't happen very often. So the more often it happens, the higher it will be on the left-hand side of your grid and the least often it happens will be on the lower part of the grid. So if it doesn't harm you or other, uh, others very much, it's going to be in the lower left-hand corner but if it happens a lot and it causes great harm, it's going to be on the right-hand side. So hope everybody's happy with that grid because I'm actually going to put numbers on it. And now I'm going to get us to think uh, along the lines of those risks that I identified. Because the next step in risk assessment, as we all know, is to manage the risks. And if you study risk management, you're probably told that, well, you can assume a risk. Um, because you know, it's not that big a deal. You could just, you know, take it on. Or you might try to transfer the risk to somebody else. There's different ways to do that. Uh, you could modify your behavior, or you could avoid an activity. So what I want to do is have you mentally sort of plot those four things that I was talking about along my grid here. So let's go to the first one, and that would be about the windows rotting. Okay, well, it's going to take a long time for the windows to rot. And, you know, is it really going to uh, have an awful lot of severity to you? Maybe not. So I am going to say to you that that is a risk perhaps that you can assume. It's going to take a long time for those windows to rot out. Just put a, little, put a few pennies aside every year, and 20 or 25 years from now, you might have to do something about those rotting windows. So you are just assuming the risks and working it into your overall management plan. What about, however, if something isn't going to happen very often, uh, so it's low frequency, but it's really going to cause you a lot of damage? And this is where you would put the building burning down. I mean, your building is not going to burn down very often. It may never burn down. But if it does, it, there is going to be a severe loss to your organization. This is where you transfer your risks. And the number one way to transfer our risk would be to purchase an insurance policy because then somebody else would pay the costs. Let's talk now a little bit about, okay, people are going to miss your building because there's no proper signage or you didn't put something on your website or nobody knows where your building is. Well, you can modify your activities. Okay, so put up some signage, do something on the website and make sure that people don't miss your building. 
And now the very last one, we all know what this is. This is going to be the avoidance issue. And remember back to what I said about the old building have an exposed well in the backyard where you fenced in an area for the children to play. Well, you know, if you send children into a backyard with a, a dangerous zone, i.e. an old well, there's going to be every chance that something is going to go wrong every time you put the kids out there. So that is something that you're going to avoid. So the reason I walked us through that little exercise is just to tell you that it is very doable to list all of the things, or as many as you can think of, uh, in terms of risks that face your organization. And only some of them are going to be ones that you can insure yourself against. The others are about assuming, modifying, or avoiding some of the operations or the behaviors that your organization is facing. A little bit about what is insurance, and I want you to take this away from you tonight because insurance, when you purchase a policy, I know caveat emptor, it is a legal document. There is no point in you saying after you something has gone wrong for you to say, well, gosh, I thought I was covered, and I think I remember somebody telling me that I was covered, and if you're not, you are out of luck. Uh, when you sign on the dotted line for an insurance policy, you have signed a legal contract. So somebody who is authorized to bind your organization on the board of directors is the person or persons who should sign a legal contract for insurance. So first and foremost, insurance is a legal contract. And it is a way to share the risk. So it's in that transfer part of the grid that I was talking about. And we all know the components of insurance. Everybody in society pays a little bit of money into a big pool of a fund. And then sometimes, occasionally, somebody has to dip into the pool and get paid out. But there, here's the issue. It activates only after something has gone wrong. So. It's not about avoiding risk. It's about dealing with something that has accidentally and un in an unforeseen way caused harm or damages to your organization. So an ins insurance is an after-the-fact sort of process. It's not about modifying your behavior or assuming your responsibilities or um, the, other thir the third one. It is something that activates only after something has gone wrong. So that was a quick one, but I want to switch now to the kinds of insurance that an organization might want to look at. And I'm going to talk, um, before I turn uh, the mic over to Craig, I'm going to talk about the two basic policies, directors and officers liability insurance and commercial general liability insurance, which are the two main policies that nonprofit organizations think that they need. They may in fact be the only two policies you ever need, but they're probably um, kind of a twin set and some organizations, i.e. insurance companies, are starting to sell them together now as a package, but they are two separate and distinct things. So I'm going to walk us through a little bit on directors and officers, and if I miss anything, Craig is going to help me out, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit on commercial general. I'm going to leave most of the event-based coverages to Craig Rowe, because he's the expert in that area. So directors and officers liability insurance, what is it? Some people think that directors and officers liability insurance is the first insurance that you purchase. It might be, it might not be, but its purpose is to cover you um, because you have limited liability as a board member. It is meant to cover the things that go wrong as a result of the business or management decisions that you have made as an organization, i.e. as a board of directors. So this insurance policy is about covering things that go wrong for the board and for the members so that you personally, as Joe or Tammy or Shirley or Harry, don't have to take on the cost of something having gone wrong. So it could be a, a contract that went awry, it could be um, you unfairly dismissed an employee and that person uh, fought back and brought you to court and looked for damages. Um, it could be about an occurrence of abuse in your organization. But you have to be really careful here because directors and officers liability insurance does cover some of those things. Not every policy 
covers all of those things. So buyer beware, caveat emptor. One of our tips is that you need to be aware of what's covered in a director's and officer's liability insurance policy. And you also need to know what it will do for you, i.e. what it will cover for you in terms of expenses you might face. Say, for example, you did unfairly dismiss an employee and that per person fought back. Well, this is the policy that might pay out to that employee an amount of money if you were found to have been at fault in court. But importantly, and Craig might uh, mention this as well, it may also cover you for the expenses of even hiring a lawyer to protect yourself because an employee could sue you and you could win in court. You've done nothing wrong, but guess what? You had to pay money out to a lawyer to protect yourself while you were going through court. And who's got the extra money laying around to pay a lawyer if you get sued? So there are several really good reasons for taking on a director's and officer's liability insurance policy. It's probably not necessary unless you're running large contractual risks, but if you are getting into the money as an organization, you, maybe it is the very first policy that you should take into consideration. The tip at the bottom of the slide there is really uh, clear, though, that directors and officers doesn't cover everything. It doesn't, for example, cover bodily injury or property damage. That's going to be on the next slide. But remember I mentioned uh, that I was going to go back to your bylaws when I talked about DNO? And that is because one of the little tips that people don't always understand when they're serving on a board of directors is that their bylaws probably should have a little component part in it that says, we the board indemnify, i.e. that is protect the finances or the costs of our board volunteers. So have a look at your bylaws and if they have an indemnification clause in there, read it and understand what it says. And if there is no clause in your bylaws which indemnifies you, i.e. saves you harmless from the costs of an action by somebody, uh, consider ha you know going through a governance review and seeing if you should put that in there. So if you're transacting business and making business decisions, you could potentially harm somebody, you could potentially sue. Yes, go buy directors and officers liability insurance, but also have a quick look at your bylaws and find out whether you as a volunteer on the board are indemnified. So I'm going to move us on now uh, fairly quickly uh, and spend a little tiny bit of time talking about commercial general liability insurance. And we will have handouts for you about this. CGL used to be called comprehensive general liability, but comprehensive was a big word, so the insurance industry very wisely called it commercial general liability, it is a policy that even nonprofit organizations who don't think of themselves as commercial should probably put in place. This policy, however, is meant to cover somebody else. Directors and officers is about protecting your board, but commercial general liability is about paying out potentially to somebody who might be harmed on your premises or at an event. And we're talking about the good old slip and fall uh, kinds of coverage in a commercial general liability policy. Um, and nonprofit organizations are just like Walmart. Somebody could slip on a banana peel in, on your front step and sue you for damages. This is the policy that will pay out to that third party. So what's a third party? It's somebody other than you and other than the insurance company. You are the first party, the insurance company is the second party, and the third party is a member of the public, somebody else who might get hurt on your premises. Interestingly, it covers bodily injury, some forms of property damage, sometimes personal injury. It covers some forms of tenant legal liability, but this is also the policy that might cover you if uh, you, for example, inadvertently slandered or libeled somebody and they fought back and looked for damages. So this is a fairly standard kind of policy. The Insurance Bureau of Canada actually standardized the component parts of a CGL policy quite a few years ago. Directors and officers, still you have to shop around and look because it may or may not cover the kinds of things you, you, that you want to be covered on. But a commercial general liability uh, insurance policy is probably the same in Newfoundland and Labrador as it is in British Columbia. So uh, there's 
a standard number of things that you can expect would be covered under CGL. Always a good idea to shop around. So that's a quick look at the twin set, Directors and Officers Liability. And I'm going to turn you over now in a sec to Joshua and ask him to open up the line so that Craig can speak to you. Because he's actually going to talk to you about other forms of insurance that are now available. Remember I said there were a lot more products. And if we have some time at around 20 after 8, we're going to open up the lines so that you can ask questions. But before I leave commercial general liability insurance, I do want to mention the fact that when you're looking at that policy, you might want to consider with your insurance provider covering your volunteers with a rider because they may or may not be specifically mentioned in your policy. They may be excluded from coverage, i.e. there's your insurer is saying, well, your volunteers are kind of part of your organization, so they're not a part of the public, so they're not a third party. On the other hand, some insurance companies will say, sure, your volunteers are members of the public and um, we can put a little rider which just means um, a clause, um, Craig can correct me if I'm not saying the right words here, a clause, an amendment to your policy that may not even cost you anything, but perhaps your insurance provider didn't think about your relationship with volunteers. So I'm going to move us along now, and I'm going to leave this slide open for a few minutes and get Josh to invite Craig in to speak to these different kinds of insurance. So over to you, Josh, and over to Craig. All right, one second there. I'm just going to unmute Craig. Okay, Craig, you uh, you have the floor. Go for it. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Darlene. Thanks, Josh. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, Darlene covered off the uh, the two biggies, I guess, general liability and uh, directors and officers. And she rightly said that I get asked all the time, <clears throat> um, will we be liable for this or, or could we be liable for that and my answer is always the same it is it doesn't matter if you're liable all that matters is that anybody can sue anybody for anything and if they do you can incur significant legal costs so it's not unusual for legal costs to be in the tens or hundreds or thousands of dollars and <clears throat> legal costs alone can put an organization uh, out of business so um, and oftentimes, as Darlene said, these, these claims are groundless, but um, but if you're sued, uh, the insurance company will, will pick it up and they'll uh, defend you, assuming it's something that was would have been insured under the policy. So I think that's uh, important to note. The, um, so we've got a list here, I'll just cover briefly each of those, and you can dig in and ask questions uh, if you like uh, at the end, as Darlene said. Um, but so, as mentioned, uh, general liability uh, policy covers for a third party, so not your own, not your own property or or or, uh, or uh, goods. And uh, so, first party coverage or your own coverage is covered under a property policy. So, if you own a building, you'd insure the building, just like you insure your house and the contents in it. That's your property coverage. Um, so, same thing when it comes to a commercial uh, building that you either rent or own, you have to, uh, or if you're prudent, buy insurance for that. Because if it burns down, if there's windstorm damage, water damage, whatever the uh, uh, the things that are insured in the policy, if those things happen, then the policy will kick in and pay. So we all kind of intuitively know that we need property insurance. That's that's pretty simple. Now, in your homeowner's policy, there's also some coverage. There's some basic crime coverage, too. But in, in a commercial policy that you would be buying um, as a uh, for a not-for-profit or a charity, you uh, usually cover it uh, in, in grouped in with property insurance, but you've got to buy it separately. Um, is crime coverage and I got crime and fidelity basically what I mean by, by splitting those things out is uh, crime basically refers to um, things that can be taken or damaged uh, by third parties so people outside of your organization and fidelity coverage is for employees so you know theft by an employee embezzlement those sorts of things so really what an insurance broker would do is we'd, we'd just look at, at your risk, like how much cash you have lying around, do you have any securities, do you have any valuables, and um, so we'd assess how much you have at risk, 
you know, how many employees have access to cash and, and those sorts of things. We look at the physical uh, protection, you know, if uh, you know, there are locks on the door, are there alarms? So those are the types of considerations, but it depends on your own circumstances, what type of crime coverage uh, you need, if any. If you're, if, uh, if you're not dealing with cash or marketable securities, your risk is probably low. So um, the, one of the great things about electronic payment methods is, uh, is that there's no cash around. But unfortunately, it does create bigger problems in terms of fidelity because employees uh, that have access to that can, can uh, tuck away some money so pretty quick uh, mm -hmm. situations like that. So it's something to chat with the insurance broker about. Um, errors and omissions, uh, we commonly call E and O. It's uh, like professional liability insurance that uh, doctors would buy, or accountants, or lawyers, or insurance brokers. Um, errors and omissions, basically, so where directors and officers covers the, uh, the 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 board and the CEO or the officers and officers of the company. Errors and omissions is meant to cover mistakes that you make in the course of your business. And just like directors and officers doesn't cover bodily injury or property damage, uh, DNO and ENO both are meant to cover financial loss, not property damage or uh, or injury, generally speaking. So it may not be applicable in your type of an organization, but if you're providing any professional service, if you're giving any advice to anybody, uh, then you may need an ENO policy, and then it'll protect anybody who is uh, giving advice or delivering those services. Um, abuse is a is a is a Big category. Darlene mentioned some of the bigger ones: the the uh, the church, um, Boy Scouts, um, <clears throat> residential schools. So it does you know it can be any type of abuse, and there's coverages that you can buy depending on what your operations are, and uh, how extensive they are, and how many people you're dealing with. Uh, it depends on you know whether you can get that coverage and how much it's going to be. Um, if you're dealing with any uh, children or anybody, uh, any of the, anyone in uh, vulnerable uh, sector, then it's a uh, it's a good idea to look at uh, coverage for abuse, just institutional abuse, institutional you know, sexual abuse uh, or, or whatnot. So uh, again, uh, talk to your broker to s assess that risk. So when you're doing the risk mapping exercise, Darlene walk through if abuse is on your list. Uh, you need to uh, address it. In terms of just to touch for one second on risk management, insurance is one of the tools in your risk, ma in risk management tool bag and for risk managers, professionals, it's the last tool that they take out, it's the safety net. Uh, the other stuff that you do like your policies and procedures are the things that prevent or mitigate the claims. They're, they're the risk management stuff that really keeps you on the wire. So Darlene mentioned some things that like transfer risk and, and managing and uh, mitigating of risk. And insurance is just one way to, one way to transfer your risk. Um, <clears throat> so uh, host liquor liability, if you serve alcohol at all or make alcohol available to people in any of your operations, then you have exposure there. And this has been emerging for 20 or 25 years, the law in this, uh, in this regard. And um, it's it's serious stuff. Uh, you you don't want to mess around there. And we just dealt with a uh, a not for profit actually today, and helped them write a uh, a liquor uh, alcohol use policy to get incidental liquor uh, available. And um, we made sure that they had the uh, the proper coverage. Because uh, if somebody has any alcohol on your premises, whether you served it or whether you um, uh, um, approved of it or allowed it even if it's just by omission because you didn't say it wasn't allowed and somebody goes out and hurts themselves or hurts somebody else uh, again doesn't matter if you're liable but you will be sued you'll be named in it and if you don't have an insurance uh, then you could be personally liable and and let's let's face it when you buy insurance for your business or your not for profit or your charity what you're really trying to do is to protect the individuals uh, that you're protecting the entity, but by doing so, you're protecting the individuals that work there and volunteer there and are on the on the board there. That's really who you're trying to protect, because because um, if they're because if the not for profit or charity doesn't have the coverage, then they look for in the individuals behind it. Um, one of the biggest things emerging now is, is cyber risk. So. Um, Basically, if you have a, a computer, and I, I include smartphones in that, if you have a computer and an internet connection, you've got cyber risk exposure. So there's lots of uh, policies out there, lots of coverages that are emerging. That's um, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm a critic of my industry uh, a lot, 
but I must say in regard to cyber risk they've done a pretty good job they're usually slow to keep up but uh, that's a field that's gotten pretty competitive the insurance companies there's not a a month goes by that I don't hear about a new product out there and they're trying to keep up with it so now there's coverage for um, not just data loss and that you know data breach but there's first party coverage in other words there's that pay, they send in an expert or pay for an expert to find a breach, fix the breach, communicate to your members or customers about the breach and uh, help you to move on. And then there's third party coverages that you can get as well. That So if you've got any customer or member or user data and that's breached and uh, they, they have suffered a loss and they claim against you, then it can cover for that as well. Uh, but as it evolves, there's a lot of things like uh, um, cyber ransom now where, where uh, malicious hackers will come in and tie up your website over your data and not give you access to it unless you pay them a couple of bitcoins which is five or ten thousand dollars now so um, again talk to your broker see if you have that risk and if you do uh, look into it automobile everybody understands about automobile insurance because you have personal uh, automobile insurance uh, but if one nuance is that if uh, your staff or volunteers are using their their own personal vehicles for your organization's use you might want to think about getting a non-owned automobile uh, endorsement put on your automobile policy and what that does is sometimes the uh, driver when you're driving your own personal vehicle for business use your insurance company the, the, the insurance company for the for your own personal vehicle could deny the claim because you were using it for business use or there could be a claim and if your personal auto only has a half a million limit and you have a claim and someone sues, sues you for, for two million um, then that could that non-owned auto could pick it up. Now the non-owned auto though is to protect the entity so you're not for profit or your charity if if they are sued for an accident that happens while an employee or a volunteer is using the, uh, their own personal vehicle for business use they would and they sue the employer as well then it would protect the employer. Um, Craig, Craig can you hear me? It's Darlene. Yes. Craig? I just want yeah. to, um, just a little tiny bit about the automobile owned and non-owned. Um, I could try to get some more information for people about that because uh, I think in our sector occasion, they're starting to be developed now a practice that the community organization that is asking volunteers to drive their cars around, for example, might actually purchase for the volunteers some additional insurance. So I think that that's an area that I'm, I'm going to try to get uh, some additional information on. Yeah, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good idea if if you can afford it because uh, it, it takes down some of the barriers. Getting volunteers is hard, uh, so if you can take away some of the risk of the volunteers, then sometimes it uh, it takes away some of their reasons for uh, for not doing so. so okay, so I'll I'll do that. And Craig, I think I can hear a little bit of paper rest rattling on your desk there. So I think that might be you. No, no, somebody no, else. Not. Okay. Um, Carry on. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just very briefly, uh, accident insurance. If you have any participants in your programs uh, that are, uh, you know, involved in the sport or other activity or, or really anything, if anybody, if they get injured while they're uh, involved in your activities, you can buy participants coverage. And it's very inexpensive, but it's like a health policy, really. Um, so it would cover further medical expenses and whatnot. And it's, and it's not based on liability. So you don't have to be liable in order to do it. If so, if a kid is hurt in your plane and in, in your program, um, and uh, you know they need uh, physio or or whatever else, uh, it would uh, it would cover for that. So uh, that's that's good if you do have any participants or that could potentially be hurt in your program. And finally, event insurance or special event insurance is a uh, type of uh, is, is a one-off one policies basically. So if um, if you uh, if your normal operation is just an office and you just deliver some programs out of an office or just paperwork and you do with people remotely on the phone, and that 99% of the year you have an office, but maybe you have a fundraiser every year. That involves uh, that the word it could be alcohol, or that's very different than our, your operations. You have a sports day or a fun day, and really changes the profile of your risk. That might not be covered under your policy um, because it's so different than your standard operations. 
then you can buy a one-off day policy for a special event and it'll cover the, the liability. And so even if you don't have a policy all year, if you don't have a general liability policy and you have an event where it's high, you know, the, the risk is higher than you normal and you, you feel like you're exposed, you can buy special events uh, coverage. So that was all I had for Arlene, unless there was questions. Sorry, I had uh, Darlene. I had you muted there for a second. Um, uh, did you guys want to take questions now, or do you want to get through any more content before we do? I want to do a little tiny bit more content. So what I was going to uh, say is, for the last ten minutes, yes, I do want to open it up, and I'm going to take your advice, Josh, on whether uh, you ask the questions and I'll lob them over to me or Craig, or whether we actually open the mic. But before we do that, I just wanted to point out that the where to get insurance the little point I want to make there is that if you go to an agent the agent will only be able to sell you the products that his or her insurance company offers and remember I did tell you to shop around but if you deal with brokers or a broker that person might be able to look for products for you in a whole bunch of different companies and don't overlook Volunteer Canada so I'm going to um, uh, mention very briefly that, uh, and I'm not endorsing them, but the Cooperators is one of the companies that has, for example, and they do have agents throughout the province, they have actually combined some of the insurances that a nonprofit organization might be interested in having a look at. So I'm actually going to put up that how to be a wise buyer slide and people can read that at their leisure. But uh, Josh, what's your best advice? Do we open it up now? on mic to everybody to potentially try and get in with a question or do you want to handle questions from the chat room? Uh, well we can do either. I have uh, one question in the chat room but if people want to ask their question verbally they can just put up their their hand uh, using the little icon there and I open their mic. Why don't we take the question from the chat room first which is um, Sammy Kelly is wondering how um, uh, how exposed or liable are directors if a situation occurs that did not come up in their risk assessment? So say they did a, a pretty rigorous risk assessment process um, and it was pretty extensive but something came up and caused a problem. Uh, how does that play into liability? Uh, Craig, I'm going to, I'm going to try that, My, uh, but then I'm going to uh, ask Craig Rowe to address it. If it's unforeseen and accidental, even though you haven't identified it, um, the, depending on what insurance policies you have put in place, they could be covered. And in point of fact, that is a good reason to get uh, an insurance that isn't nailed down too much or has a wide scope on what you're covered for. This is It could be risky business. The, the issue is that there are not too many things that can happen to you that the insurance company hasn't either heard about or already covered. Um, so Craig, did, did you want to try and answer that question as well? Let me just unmute you, Craig, if you want to add anything there. Okay, you're unmuted. I'm going to leave you unmuted, Craig, in case you want to answer anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, Darlene. It's, um, it doesn't matter whether or not you've conceived of it. If it's, if it's within your standard scope of operations and it's a uh, insured peril or it's, it's, it's not excluded, if it's included in the policy, basically, it's covered. It doesn't matter if you had contemplated it or not. Yeah, I think so that I the, think the bit about, sorry, Josh, the covered. bit about, yeah, and the bit about understanding the exclusions is a good point there. I mean, it, pretty much every insurance policy I've ever seen, and it would be the same for you, does have exclusions, things like um, terrorist acts and things like that. So if something is excluded specifically, yes, you wouldn't, you would not be covered. But uh, other than that, insurance companies are pretty knowledgeable about the risks that you face. Any other questions, Josh? Uh, I don't see any others, um, so I'll just give people a minute here if anyone wants to either type it into the question box and, oh, there we go, one in the question box. Uh, Tina Mulroney is asking, uh, where do occupational health and safety risks come into all of this? Um, occupational health and safety risks, um, you mean for... Uh, employees. I guess from an, from an, yeah, and I guess from an insurance point of view, exactly from from employees. I think that's what Tina probably means. I, 
Okay, well, I'm pretty sure that that would be covered by workers' compensation. And remember I said at the outset, uh, tonight we're not going to talk specifically about workers' compensation because that's a specific kind of industry-based insurance that exists in every province um, in Canada. But if you are facing an occupational and health and safety risk and an employee is injured, one would hope that they're covered by workers' compensation. Right. Uh, right. Thanks, Darlene, and Tina says thanks as well. No problem. Okay, so Josh, maybe I'll just take it uh, down to the end if you if you don't see any other questions there. I do talk? not, so you can go right ahead. Okay. I want to leave us with uh, a little bit of um, a suggestion that you need to be a wise buyer, and I want to kind of sum up with uh, some tricks of the trade, and Craig, uh, jump in at any time. I want to reinforce the fact that there are numerous products out there. Just listen to everything that Craig told us about tonight. And he tied it, thank you very much, Craig, back to your assessment of your risks. There are a lot of policies out there. Don't over-insure yourself. You don't have to go out and purchase everything that we talked about tonight. And in fact, your insurance agent or your broker follows a code of conduct which requires them not to oversell insurance to you. So don't be worried about that. They're not going to upsell you on insurance. They actually have to follow that code of conduct which has been laid down by the Insurance Bureau of Canada. So they will actually help you a little bit. If you've got some questions, reach out to your brokers. Brokers and agents can help you. Additionally, and I'm at the bottom of the screen now, Service NL has a senior employee, her name is Pam Senior, who answers questions about insurance and risk for nonprofit organizations and we have an ombudsman in the province who will protect us if we think something went awry in our uh, assessment of risk or how it relates to insurance if we were oversold. So ask these people, they are the experts, they will be able to help you. Just to go up a little bit on the slide, I want you to understand whatever limits are there and remember I said a policy could for example cover you on the costs of a lawyer to help yourself out in court. Well. I can assure you that the policy who will pay out to help you go to court with a lawyer has limits on how much you will be able to pay. Maybe you can only pay up to $10,000 to a lawyer. Maybe you're lucky enough to have a policy that might cover you for legal costs. Um, I think I even heard Craig mention $100,000. Now, we're not trying to scare you. These are very, very, very seldom happening. But if you do have insurance in place, you want to know what the limits are because remember it's a contract and you can't go back and say, oh, I thought all my lawyer's fees were covered and guess what, they're not all covered. So know what an insurance policy does not cover. That's important. Understand the exclusions. Know what they do cover, know what they don't cover. We always end our webinars with some best practices and I'm just <clears throat> going to take a shot at it now. And I like to think of your best practices uh, along the lines of things that you would do on an ongoing basis, from time to time, or at least annually. So on an ongoing basis, you should always be trying to assess and manage the risks that are faced by your organization. Remember I said that's why you're incorporated, to take on the liability and assume the risks that you as volunteers want to pass over to your incorporated organization. But it doesn't excuse you from being trustees with a fiduciary responsibility to practice care, diligence, and skill. So assessing and managing risks is something that you should be doing all the time. Try to stick within your mission because if you step outside your mission, you're immediately increasing the chance that something can go wrong and you would be held liable for something that you don't have any legal business doing. So if you're a nonprofit daycare center, don't try to be a riding school. Um, insurance companies like you to record any incidents and keep maintenance logs if you're uh, facing uh, any kind of risky activity because that will help you not only continue to assess risk but it will help the insurance company. So don't be uh, embarrassed or uh, reluctant if an insurance company asks you for incident um, histories. It's always a good idea to keep them even if you haven't yet purchased your insurance. Something that you should be doing from time to time is reviewing the pricing of insurance if you are purchasing insurance. Uh, obviously it has to be within your budgets. Remember I was very cautious about not over-insuring yourself. Well don't under-insure yourself either. 
uh, you should read up on insurance and what it means to you. I'm really hoping that you'll all have a nice crack at that toolkit that I'm posting, the one from Alberta. And if you are insured, don't wait very long to report any claims to an insurance company. They want to hear from you fairly quickly. There might even be some time limits on the reporting. So that is a best practice. So from time to time, uh, pay attention to those issues. Annually, uh, have a look at your insurance policies. Remember I said uh, shop around, uh, caveat mTOR, all of those uh, buzzwords apply on insurance. You never know the price of insurance for your policy might have gone down or you perhaps you could get a better cost at a different company. So review your coverages and your risks, for example, may have changed. So you might one year as a nonprofit daycare center have a huge risk around your property, but then you've done huge renovations and installed um, new safety features at your site and your risk has gone way down and you may not need the insurance coverage that you had before. I'm not saying don't buy insurance, I'm saying it's wise to have a look at what coverages you have and look at them in light of the risks that you actually are facing. So go through that risk assessment process um, maybe once a year, at least every couple of years. Uh, consider whatever riders or endorsements need to be put onto your policies and know whether you can put something onto a policy as a rider, um, perhaps maybe liquor or an event, or if you have to go and get that whole new insurance policy, the kinds of things that Craig was talking about. And always, 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 my last point is share information across the board. The first piece of advice I gave you tonight was uh, if you're setting up risk assessment, don't act alone. Get a committee in place. Same thing with uh, continuing assessment of risk. You want to share information on your coverages, on your risks, on your insurance policies, right across the board. Every single member of your board is just as liable as any other member of your board of directors, so you should all be aware of what you're doing to manage risk and when you're purchasing insurance. So if you've got any other questions, I would encourage you uh, to get in touch with us. Uh, our coordinates are there. And I would like to say, again, a great big thank you to Volunteer Mount Pearl for making this uh, series possible. And please be sure to stay in touch. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Josh Smee, our wingman tonight, for helping us on the technical side. And once again, uh, Craig Rowe, who so very kindly gave us his um, professional and personal time tonight. So thank you, Craig, Debbie, and Josh. And thanks for joining us, everybody. And uh, we'll see some of you in person for the final session. On the 23rd of March at 44 Arena Road at the Soccer Hut. All right, have a great night. I'm going to end the webinar now.